Welcome to a new vlog. Today we have a repair video and if you're like me from time to time you enjoy doing a repair. Not necessarily a complicated and long one because who has time for that between a full-time job, a YouTube channel and a kid slash family but a quick one just to get the pleasure of actually getting a device back to life and also getting something useful out of it. So I am a fan of Ubiquiti networking gear. I use them at home and I've been on the lookout for something broken from, from their lineup to try and repair it. And a couple of months back, I managed to score this Unify access point for uh, 25 euros off eBay plus five euros in shipping. It was marked as not working, not powering on. Um, and a model like this is about 180 USD or euros depending on where you order it from and it's still an active model though if you get a new one it might be like a newer revision than what I got here it's not exactly state of the art in terms of Wi-Fi speeds but still pretty decent and good enough for my home usage because it can do both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz up to 1.7 gigabits per second maximum data rate so for me it was well worth risking the 30 euros for this particular uh, model knowing that there is also a chance where it's it may it may very well be beyond economic repair and I would be left with a 30 euros loss in this case. So I received the unit exactly as it was shown in the product listing. I got no uh, mounting plate. You can purchase that as a separate um, uh, product from Ubiquiti but they come in a pack of three for 30 US dollars so it's it's not worth it for me because I can probably 3D print something. Uh, the unit on the back uh, looks like this. We notice this is the Nano HD model. It does have some markings uh, that say 304, the blue marker that was probably the room it was it was placed in. WSS, I don't know uh, what that means. It also says DEF here, uh, which might be short from defect. Overall, the exterior looks pretty good. Just this small, looks like a burn mark. Um, on the front of the unit. I can probably clean this up and, and fix it. Uh, one aspect I was particularly interested in is the RJ45 connector and it looks to be in very good condition. It's not mangled or anything like that which is a good sign. I also haven't noticed any uh, prying signs on the edge of the enclosure. Right now I have already been inside of this. It has already been opened but there are no marks uh, which uh, to me indicated that nobody tried opening it up uh, which is always preferred in the case of a repair. So I wanted to check what would happen if I would power this thing up before I would open it up and it does take a uh, PoE input over this RJ45 and it's a 1 gigabit uh, link here that's the only port that this product offers and I do have a genuine PoE injector from Ubiquiti and upon plugging this in, I noticed the PoE injector status light kept resetting, which immediately made me think it goes into some form of protection like overcurrent and keeps trying again and again, then hitting the protection limit and repeats forever. Now, this is neither a good or a bad sign because it can be, for example, something as simple as a failed capacitor shorting a power supply internally, which would be super easy to fix, but can also be something more complicated like a failed application process or Wi-Fi chip, which is uh, shorting a power rail. That would be nearly impossible to fix, certainly beyond economic repair as I see it. So we need to investigate this further. Now, the top of the enclosure is plastic while the bottom is metal something like aluminium or magnesium, I'm not sure, uh, but it is held together uh, not with screws but with clips. So in order to open it, uh, you have to carefully insert some pry tools, prefer preferably some soft plastic ones, and slowly uh, pry it open. I believe there are four clips in total. We'll uh, get a view of them in a moment. And in my case, I managed to pry it open uh, without leaving any marks. So these are the four clips uh, holding it together and these match up with another set of uh, clips which are on the metal base of this enclosure. And now that we are inside the unit we do notice a couple of interesting things. First off the uh, alien looking antennas jump out. That's something you will always find inside Ubiquiti equipment. They design their own antennas and they always look funky. And we have a single board construction and I also see a uh, date code in here. 
which would equate to November 2021, which means this unit was manufactured less than four years ago. Not great, not terrible. On the PCB, we notice some unpopulated footprints. This looks like a JTAG header. This could have been a flash chip footprint. Uh, some power regulation not populated. Also notice a couple of DC to DC converters in this area, probably generating some power rails for the processor on the other side. Uh, this will be interesting to look at in a moment. And on this side, we notice the PoE converter circuit. So this will be the circuit in charge of uh, stepping down the PoE voltage coming through the RJ45 to something else that is uh, then further down converted by these buck converters. This uh, D3 part that you see here, uh, this was populated. I removed this in my repair attempt and we're going to be talking about that soon. I also want to have a look on the other side of this PCB just to check for any uh, visual signs of uh, problems. So I have to remove these four screws and check out the attention to detail. They have blue Loctite on these screws. Now there might be some uh, suction force holding this down because of the thermal pads between uh, the processor and the back of the enclosure which acts as a heat sink. So I recommend again using a soft plastic pry tool and don't go too deep, just uh, work your way around the edge just to get this to unstick from the thermal pads. And on the back side, uh, pretty much as expected, we have a bunch of chips. One of them must be the application processor, probably this one coupled with the uh, DRAM here. Uh, then we must have some um, analog or Wi-Fi radio chipsets. And we also notice a few uh, more parts um, which are related to the uh, DC to DC uh, and power over Ethernet input circuitry. So we'll have to take a look at these very soon because that's our starting point. We need to check if our PoE input is somehow shorted. And actually the first thing that I want to check is uh, with my thermal camera. So I'm going to grab my E2 Plus with its uh, manual uh, focus mode. This will allow me to, uh, when powering the PCB, to generally check if there are any hot spots on the PCB. And that will give me an indication of where I should look for the problem further on. Uh, but before powering this board up, I'm going to place it back on its heatsink because we don't know if any of those processors are going to get hot and we don't want to damage it in that way. So just make sure you have it placed on the heatsink when you power it up. The first thing that I noticed through the thermal camera was diode D6 getting hot, which is actually on the back of the PCB, hence why you'll see me running the board without the metal back case uh, as a heatsink. And it was actually getting higher um, but the PoE injector kept cutting off, which allowed it to cool off, then start heating back up. Now, D6, even though I haven't been able to decode its actual uh, part number, looks to be just a transient protection diode that you'll typically find at the input of a, any PoE power supply circuit and is there to catch transients that may arrive on the twisted copper pairs. How do I know this? Well, uh, I have actually designed PoE circuits and I have also uh, checked many datasheets for PoE controller ICs. So there are two things that we can say about this. A, the circuit should run fine if we remove this D6 protection diode, and B, if it was subjected to heavy transient, it can fail short. So next up, I removed it using the Secure HT140 soldering tweezers, which by the way, I reviewed in a separate video. If you're interested in checking that out, I will link that video down below so you can check it out. Now, plugging power back in with D6 removed, the injector was no longer resetting, which is already an improvement, but the access point showed no signs of life. Looking through the thermal camera, we notice another hotspot, which is the PoE controller IC, uh, has, is marked as U3 on the PCB. Now, this guy is running at over 150 degrees Celsius, which is the maximum for the selected range on my thermal camera. It was probably going over that. Now, clearly not a good sign. That thing is toasty as a grill. You do not want to be touching that with your bare finger. Now, at this point, I check the part number on the IC, and this appears to be an uh, LM5071. And inside the datasheet of this guy, uh, we have some application example schematics, which will help us understand our device under test better. 
because typically when someone designs a PCB, they tend to follow the recommended application schematic. And I think this particular schematic from the datasheet fits our actual application, minus the auxiliary power circuitry, which is not present on ours. So I think the D6 diode that was getting hot on our board is this guy in the reference schematic. This is a 58 volt rated TVS diode in charge of protecting the input from transients. Now this starts to make more sense because the equipment might have seen some heavy transients which damaged that TVS diode that was supposed to clamp uh, the input and then eventually the transients reached the input of the LM5071 controller I see and damaged that too potentially but in order to double check that the rest of this PCB the rest of the circuit is actually functional I can entirely bypass this PoE power circuitry and just feed power directly at the output of the PoE circuitry but what voltage might that be? Could it be stepping down to 12 volts? But what if it's stepping down to 5 volts and then doing further regulation? Well, through some careful reverse engineering I looked at the flyback uh, transformer part number uh, they were using here on the PCB I checked the uh, output capacitor uh, voltage rating, which was, you know, 6.3 volts, so it couldn't have been 12 volts. I also checked, you know, feedback resistors that this IC is using. I correlated everything and figured out that the PoE circuit is likely stepping down to 5 volts. But even knowing that with the PoE controller I see potentially shorting stuff, even if I would inject 5 volts at the output of the circuit, it could still be pulled to ground. So I thought a quick fix for that is just to remove the rectifier diode from the output of the transformer, uh, which is this guy in the reference schematic, to effectively isolate the PoE output from the downstream 5 volt rail. So in our case, that was D3, which is here. You see it already removed on this uh, PCB. And all said and done, I removed D3, I applied 5 volts with a limit of 1 amp for my bench PSU, and to my surprise, the access point showed its first signs of life, its LEDs started blinking, and in no time, it was being uh, discovered by the Unify app on my smartphone, and it was ready to adopt. So I do have confirmation that the rest of this PCB is working fine. So there is a good chance that if I replace the controller IC and the input protection, things are going back to normal. So I ordered myself the parts from uh, Mauser. I ordered the controller IC and the TVS protection diode. But while I was ordering this, these, I thought, let's also get a spare transformer and uh, a spare uh, switching MOSFET just in case there is something wrong with these, might as well get them in one shipment. It's unlikely these are damaged and they weren't, you know, too expensive, but we'll find out soon. So I desoldered the presumed uh, bad controller I see for the PoE circuit. I soldered in a new one. I installed a new transient protection TVS diode. And I also put back the uh, diode on the output of the transformer uh, just to recomplete the uh, circuit. So now uh, I can do a test. I have my um, original uh, Ubiquiti PoE injector here. I have the board placed on the heatsink. I have my uh, thermal camera close by so we can have a look to see if uh, anything is heating up right now. Everything is at room temp. So let's plug it in and see what we did. And we get nothing, no signs of life. The PoE adapter keeps resetting, so there's still something bad uh, in that PoE circuit. Let's investigate this further. Oh my god, I just realized what I did. Uh, I was just looking around right here on the silicone mat where I did my soldering. Do you notice anything in this area? Yeah, that's right. This is the new diode that I was supposed to be installing. You can see its pads are really clean. So that can only mean one thing. I reinstalled the bad diode on the board. So let's remove this. Okay, so this is take two. Now with the good uh, TVS diode installed, let's plug this in. Hopefully it will all go fine this time. We see stable uh, power draw, 3.5 watts. And we got a light turning on. Yep, it should now be showing up in the uh, Unify app. Let me quickly check that.
And it does. Yes, it's alive. It seems like the access point is alive now. I also have my uh, multimeter in here. Let's do a quick check of the uh, output voltage on our PoE circuit. And we have 5.09 volts, which is very good and stable. So things are looking good now. So I think we can call this a successful repair. The system is up and running and is detected by the Unify app and the network controller. The voltage at the output of the PoE circuit is a stable 5 volts and the temperatures are within expected ranges, no dangerous hot spots. And the total cost for this repair was $3.50, which includes the controller IC plus the TVS diode purchased from Mauser. I got free shipping on this uh, parts order because there was more parts added to this order uh, for other projects, which raised the total over the free shipping threshold. So I just got myself an access point worth 180 US dollars for less than $40 total cost, including the repair. I would say that's a pretty good deal, especially considering how much I enjoyed troubleshooting and eventually repairing it. I would also be interested in reading your comments down below. Let me know maybe how you feel about repairs, if you agree with me, or maybe what was your last repaired item. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Now, just a quick note slash rant. If we go to the Texas Instruments website for the LM5071, which is the POA controller IC that we just uh, replaced, well, we noticed that it has an input voltage of maximum 60 volts. And if we check its data sheet, it's uh, well working voltage up to 60 volts and absolute maximum up to 80 volts. But if we take a look at it, this webpage on the uh, Texas Instruments website, if we scroll down a little bit, they say, hey, there's a new device you might be interested in, which has similar functionality. And what is this device improving? Well, it provides more robust protection from unexpected voltage transients rated to 100 volts. And if we go to the datasheet of this new device, what's the first feature they advertised? Enhanced ESD write-through capability. And if we scroll down to its uh, voltage rating, well, we can see that it is now the absolute maximum input voltage is now rated for 100 volts and they give you a more detailed ESD rating values which uh, could very well be improved over the previous generation. So I wonder if this could maybe be a more general problem affecting the LM5071 uh, chips and maybe they had a bunch of them damaged by uh, transient voltage and that's why they developed this new version which has improved ESD protection. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below.